Hello, welcome to episode number two in this Strathmore workshop on spontaneous painting. So today, using uh, method number one, which I showed in the first workshop episode. So if you haven't seen that, you might want to go take a look. But in this video, I will use method number one, a wet in wet approach. And I'll take you from start to finish throughout an entire spontaneous painting. And I'll try to kind of clue you in to what I'm thinking as I go. But you do not have to match these colors. Actually, colors are not important. This is a process, and I'm just trying to tell you how I do and how I use the process. Let's get started. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started on one of these in earnest. And in this, we're going to be using the first method, the wet and wet method. I'm going to stick with uh, a similar color scheme as I did in the example, the start example, wet and wet, and that's going to be sort of a rusty color, and that's a combination of dragon's blood, still the grain brown, marsh red, and then mixes of ultramarine blue, some permanent violet bluish, and maybe some neutral tint. We want to keep it simple. But first, let's get this pre-wet. I'm going to use my two-inch Princeton Neptune modeler. A little bit of color in that brush. I didn't quite get it clean, but that's all right. Just want that nice and spread even. And I'm going to be a little more judicious and selective about how I apply the paint versus the, the start demos that I did. Now, I still want watercolor to carry a lot of the painting technique at this stage. I want watercolor basically to just delight me and surprise me. But in order to do that, I've got to kind of hold back. And the biggest danger here is putting too much paint and too much water. So let's start with some brown. Still the grain. And about the only thing I'm thinking here is compositionally. I just want some kind of balance. But it's going to be at this point very abstract. You're not really trying to paint a landscape per se yet. All right, now let's come in here with some ultramarine blue. Maybe tap in a little bit of the permanent violet bluish. It's okay to think in terms of landscape forms, you know, tree lines. Maybe imagine a bit where a ground plane would go. I'm going to come over and get some dragon's blood, which is sort of a red iron oxide. And that's just going to be a slightly different hue in uh, that very brown warm area. Let's go ahead and get some spatter in here. Now, some of this paper is already starting to dry. I probably didn't get it wet enough. And we probably have enough paint on the paper for now. You can always come back, add more washes after this dries. Of course, I say that, and I feel like I want to add a little bit of this blue and violet up in here. As the water disperses the pigment, sometimes you got to make decisions about where you want to go in and deepen the pigment or add more, because it'll disperse it sometimes more than you expect. And I want to see if I can create some backwashes, and that'll get me a little bit of contrast areas just adding a little bit of clear water and you see how it's pushing that pigment back and i got some fairly distinct spatter there but i think that i like that i don't think i'm going to smooth that out at all but this would be the stage when it's wet like this where if you want to connect shapes and maybe make it so that it's not quite so busy you can do that also this is a good point at which you want to more add more of these contrast points, like I did here with water. You can also do it by blotting. Now I want to break up that sort of hard diagonal edge. So what I'm doing is I'm just coming in here and blotting. 
anywhere uh it's a good idea to do that anywhere you want to break up an unnatural edge just give yourself a little more edge variety i like what's developing here i like the little uh backwashes here they're creating some nice contrast it's all very soft so it's going to uh, make for some nice areas to paint i think and you can cut uh, enhance some edges that you may see forming a lot of that you do in the next step so you want to be careful not to do it too much but you think well right here would be a really great edge for contrast can do a little of that and I'm just using a little bit of damp clear water and a brush which loosens that up and then I'm just kind of blending it with this technique though you got to make sure you don't use too much or you'll get a lot of these backwashes that will get out of hand now see some nice uh, verticals developing here maybe I'll pull some of that blue up but you got to be careful of overworking and i know because i have done it many many times you see how simple that was and and less is really more when you're doing the starts for spontaneous painting can't stress that enough less is more you just don't want to get carried away and get too much paint and water on the paper and it's gotten starting to get too dry, so I can't really pick up much. Maybe a little bit there. Anyway, I'm happy. I'm happy with those first washes. That's a good start. Let's let this dry, and we'll come back to it. All right. Well, we're ready to begin detailing this, and this is the most fun part, I think. But admittedly, it can also be the most intimidating and difficult part. It's the part I get the most questions about. Watercolor has done its thing mostly. You want to utilize what you see here as much as possible. Now, the the question I inevitably get is, Steve, how do you see, how do you see your scene? And my answer is always the same. I don't see a scene. I see possibilities, but I don't see a scene yet. What I do is I take one tiny step, and that usually involves uh, edges and contrast. So I try to accentuate edges and contrast. Now, I do want to find a center of interest, and that's probably going to be a little over here, just sort of off center. I could see a stand of trees in there. How I'm going to do that yet, I don't know. Uh, I have a nice edge here that I got started on when I uh, picked up some of that with tissue. So um, a lot of it is making the edges a little more distinct, maybe carrying them over into another area. Now I've got my number eight long round here. I like it because it's got a very sharp point. So if I hold the brush back a bit, I can get a dancy sort of a tip. So I'm going to take that edge around, kind of try to make this form a little more distinct. Now in order to get that to blend, I need to make it look like part of the, the paint that's already there. So I'm going to blend, softly blend away from that edge. But you want to be matching your colors. Now I'm adding a little bit more neutral tint to this to, so I can subdue that blue a little bit. That blue is really intense. So I'm going to have that ultramarine blue, but I'm also adding a little bit of neutral tint and could create a dual edge. So a lot of these decisions I make on the fly. So maybe I want to enhance this edge here, contrast, and create another one up here. Let's, we'll just see how that looks. And then blend away from those edges. But I've got a nice shape working here. So I'm going to try to continue to enhance that. And you don't have to take away where you have soft edges, but you do have contrast, you don't have to take away every soft part of the edge. You can just add little bits of clarification, edge clarification. Kind of adds to the mystery, the, the lost and found edges. Now we've got some nice shapes here that might make for distinct trees. So I'm going to start adding those. Let's, they're kind of spires. So let's make some more or less fir tree type shapes. 
And notice uh, I'm using the, the thin edge of my, or the thin point of my brush, and I'm holding it back further. That just allows the tip to dance a little more. Gives you a little bit more natural mark making. We got an edge coming down in here, so I may, I'm looking for spots where I can add some very deep contrast. That That's a really good thing, especially in your center of interest area. And it's really just a matter of taking these small steps, taking a look at your piece and deciding what you want to do next. And we have a nice little sort of a foliage shape here. So I'm going to enhance that edge a bit and then blend that out. Let's add some, some tree trunks here just to sort of start making sense of the spires back here. And where we have this light, light sort of brighter spot, that's going to be a perfect area to add some, some spires. A lot of these types of fir trees will not have much foliage on them at all, or very little. You don't need many, and you want to make sure you got some organic spacing in your trees. Don't make picket fence trees. Don't make them all the same size and don't space them out evenly. And a lot of times you can start in one area and then you can just kind of grow the detail out. But I like to leave a lot of soft area. Especially as I get away from my chosen center of interest. That could almost be a waterfall. I'm going to think about that. Uh, I've got a nice kind of a streaky. I know it's not very... Uh, white, but it could be reflecting some of the surrounding colors. And some of these spires can make much fainter, so they sort of fade into a mist. And I think I'm going to carry that over here so that I have a few sort of breaking up this area. could also do this with a, a rigger or a liner. So let me do some of that just to show you. This is a Princeton Aqua Elite number one liner. Same sort of deal. If you hold it further back, you get a nice dance uh, to the tip. Maybe we're going to make this some kind of a tree. All right. Well, before I get too carried away, just working on this area, I see a little ghosty thing here that uh, could be some foliage so we'll just kind of make that a little more distinct just a little bit can do a lot of really cool things with the rigger when you turn it on its side you get a, a lot of nice little scuffs and dry brush marks something you should experiment with we got a bit of a ground plane i mean it could be irregular and hilly but kind of going through here so when I see that developing, a lot of times I like to try to enhance that. In this case, and you don't want to just draw a line, obviously, and kind of indicate where that ground plane is going. Break it up with texture if you want. Let's uh, make some parts of this tree over here a little more distinct. Catch the eye. And I'm telling you, uh, again, you know, the question I get the most is, how do you see? What do you see? How do you decide? A lot of this is spur of the moment decisions. And one decision is affected by another. You know, what I do in one place just affects what I do somewhere else. So you're not going to be successful with these every time or even right off the bat. You may have to work at it a bit. Let's see if we can make this into 
a waterfall. It's just too irresistible. You have a sort of a cliff embankment on this side and a little bit of one over here. And I'm just trying to render some natural edges here that look like embankments and cliffs and rocks and I'm just going to let it all sort of fade into a mist down here. And when you do spontaneous painting like this, uh, inevitably you'll end up doing a lot of negative painting. So I know some people have a hard time sort of seeing that way. It just takes practice, but basically you're, you're painting where the darker values are and you're leaving edges to indicate brighter, more highlighted objects. All right, these, these areas over here are dry, so um, let's see how they look when I add some tree branches, tree trunks. And I don't want them to be too dark. Start off light and I can always darken them. When you're doing this, uh, watch the scale of your trees. I've got these fir trees which look fairly distant, so uh, these here are going to have are going to be massive trees. But I don't want to get carried away with too thick of limbs or tree trunks, or they'll look uh, too cartoony. The scale will look wrong. Let's get some of these fir trees a little bit bigger. I could be doing this with that eight number eight round if I wanted to. Got the fine tip. But I, I kind of like doing the rigor. I'm able to get, I think, more interesting marks. And it doesn't hold as much water, so I think that's kind of critical. If you get too much water on here, you're just going to get little puddly shapes, which will create hard edges. So, yeah, I'm just going to negative paint a little bit of this over here. Just give myself an edge. It feels like it needs an edge to catch the eye. And I may just come over here and connect with this shape. Means I need to kind of blend that out here away from that edge just making it up as you go that's what spontaneous painting is about and really honestly truly the most important part is not the the picture i end up with but all of these techniques that i'm practicing that's how spontaneous painting started for me and has been the most beneficial part all right, so I hope you can see what I did. I created uh, some more distinct shapes out of what was happening over here. It just felt like there was an awful lot of open, flat color up here. And I just wanted to add a little more interest on this edge. Well, at this point, there's any number of things I could do. And I could go on with this for hours. Uh, I just want to get maybe a few more eye-catching details in here. I want to leave a lot. Of of this is soft. I need to, to bring in just little bits maybe of texture to contrast with the softness. It's okay to do like some, like I like to do some little drawn shapes that might look like uh, rocks or rocky edges. Kind of like that. Uh, I end up usually continuing to use the rigor almost through the end unless I'm highlighting maybe over here where we have these wet streaks 
Maybe we add some texture to the edges of that. I'm going to take this sort of blue here and resolve that into some sort of textural calligraphic edges. I want to get some, some texture in a few places. When I get to this stage, uh, and you may notice that I jump around a lot, and I actually think that's a, uh, important because uh, I'm sitting back and I'm letting my eye take in the whole thing and saying, what does it need? What would feel better? What would balance it? So I may work a little over here, a little over there. I'm going to turn this area over here, this bright area, into sort of a flat. Oh, a bare patch of ground. Maybe some little sandy flats. I don't know. All right, well, we're going to call this done. And what's great about these is you just never know what you're going to end up with. But spontaneous paintings, especially the starts, just make a really good base for you to practice on. I love the fact that I ended up with some little waterfally areas in here. Didn't plan that. Just kind of delightful to see what happens. And there are parts in here that I painted in that there wasn't anything to go off of. So sometimes you'll have blank areas. And you'll want to paint in like these trees. But let me just suggest that the best way to enjoy spontaneous painting is to think of it as a learning tool and not an automatic landscape generation tool. And not all of these turn out. I've done tons of these and there have been some that I've been satisfied with. There have been some that I have not been. But I always try to look at it as a learning experience, trying different compositions trying color schemes, trying techniques for painting trees or rocks or spatter, how to turn spatter into details. I always try to look at this as an experimental process where I learn how to do something. Thanks everyone. Hope you enjoyed that. In the next workshop episode, we're going to use starting method number two. And again, we'll go start to finish through an entire spontaneous painting. See you there.